Good morning. This is Pastor Jack Gray wel welcoming you to the morning worship service at Grace and Corsica CRC. We begin always with that song, My Peace. And because we do that every Sunday, our Resurrection Sunday morning will be a message about Resurrection Peace from John 20. And we're going to follow how that song every, that we sing every Sunday is an echo of Resurrection Sunday and Jesus' glorious Easter arising. So we're just really thankful for that. I know that you're missing one another, but we want to meet two men that Jesus met on the way to the cross. And so today we'll be looking at Simon and Centurion. God's greeting to us this morning comes from Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And then we would be singing. That was our call to worship. And then we would be singing, and rejoice ye pure in heart. And we certainly have great reason to rejoice, even with the threat of the virus around us. We have our Savior Jesus, who's controlling our lives. And he greets us with these words. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning, we miss greeting each other, but we're going to offer a prayer for the person who you would likely be greeting this morning if you were sitting in the pew. And that prayer will extend to uh, each person. And I'm going to pause at the end for you to fill in the names of the people who you would be shaking hands with today. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the privilege of prayer. We know that there's nothing that can ever interrupt our prayer time with you. Our mutual greeting time has been interrupted. But Father in heaven, we know the people that we likely would be shaking hands with this morning. And so we pause to pray for one another, each praying for each other. Thank you for hearing our prayer. For Jesus' sake, amen. We're now going to go to God's law for the fifth Sunday in Lent. I think you probably already saw the slide here. This isn't a perfect program, you know. This is a, our makeshift way of doing things. So we're going to go to God's law for the fifth Sunday in Lent. The Lord has set the law before you return to the Lord your God. We have had other gods. We've not loved the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, and with all our strength. Return to the Lord your God, who sends you Jesus Christ to lead you to redemption. We have not remembered the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Return to the Lord your God, who sends you Jesus Christ. We have misused the name of the Lord with tongue and heart. Return to the Lord your God, who sends you Jesus Christ to stand before God in your behalf. We have not honored our father or mother in deed or thought. 
Jesus Christ has the power of forgiveness from his heavenly father. We are guilty of murder and hatred, of lust and adultery, of theft and robbery, of libel and slander, of coveting what is our neighbor's. Return to the Lord your God. We come to God now in our morning prayer, asking for him to strengthen each of us physically, but also spiritually and emotionally. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we know what the physical toll is on us because we're separated from one another to avoid spreading the COVID-19 virus and we know what it is for us spiritually not to be able to worship together we know that the heart of worship is that we congregate together the very word church that comes from the greek word to assemble and belong together father in heaven out of respect for our government and for the mandate that they've issued, we are not meeting physically. But we have taken time to think about whose hand we would be shaking. Time to think about all the people who would join their voices in song with us. And we are so thankful for them. We thank you that we may pray for each other and that the avenue of prayer is always wide open. And as we pray for one another, we're reminded to give you praise for the bodies you gave us, bodies that are able to resist disease, heal from surgery, and be strengthened. And so, Father in heaven, we pause to pray for those who are facing those kinds of issues. We think of Chad Wendland and the chemotherapy that he's been having and ask you to bless that and to extend his life for many years. We think as well of Ann Scolton's daughter, Maria, who's been battling cancer. And we think of our many shut-ins, a few in home, but some at leisure living, others at the Good Samaritan Center, and we ask you, Lord, to hold each one of them close to you. And while we think about caring for each other, we're reminded that we have in our congregations that we care fund, that we give financially, so that physical needs can be met. And we're reminded, Father in heaven, of the importance of that gift of helping each other along. And one of the things that never changes is our birthday. We're so happy that past week of Peggy Gerlach and Alice Ward and Shauna Vanderpool celebrated their birthdays. And that this week, we have Jaden uh, Bars and Rod Foreman and Le Levi Van Z who are also able to celebrate a birthday. What a great time it is when we celebrate that you brought us into the world and that we could be your child as well as the child of our parent and that you gave us the sacrament of baptism and that you promised to be with us the, for the rest of our lives. For these things we celebrate each time we have a birthday. And we come to you, Father in heaven, to pray that the leaders of our country, our state, even our local governments, will make wise decisions about our future. We know that we're living in a time like we've never, not lived in before, but we also expect that you will give us a future that's bright and wonderful because we are your children 
and we belong to you. So keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, who is the author of our faith and the one who makes it perfect. And as we come down closer and closer to remembering Monday, Thursday, that precious time when Jesus gathered last with his disciples and they turned the Old Testament Passover into the Lord's Supper. We pray that by the time those that day arrives, that we will be able to worship together again in joy and peace. And may it be that on Palm Sunday, we can enjoy singing together some of the songs of joy in the life of the church. And especially that on Resurrection Sunday, the world calls Easter. We rejoice in the marvelous new life we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And help us, Father in heaven, to remember that we're in the middle of a pastoral search process. We pray that the people we're interviewing, and the people who are awaiting for this to pass uh, so that they can come and visit Corsica, that this will be a time of waiting, discerning, and desiring to know your will. We have every confidence, Father, that you will send just the right pastoral family be part of our community, to lead us as a congregation spiritual, to provide that emotional equilibrium that's so important for us all, to give us the constant assurance that you're with us and you care for us. And we pause to pray for our children and our teens. We know that our younger children cannot understand what is happening in the world around them. We know that as teenagers, there's many things they would have done and celebrated, none of which can be done now. And so we ask you to give them that inner peace that passes understanding. And they'll, they will remember that every Sunday we open singing my peace and on Resurrection Sunday, have the privilege of seeing how Jesus' resurrection touches every Sunday when we meet. You are a great and wonderful God, and we thank you so much for all you've done for us. It's our joy to praise our God, from whom all blessings flow. Amen. If we were in church today, we would be singing at the cross because that's exactly what we're doing is we're moving toward the cross and we're coming now to two men who are very close to Jesus at the cross. The scripture that we have is from Matthew 27, 32 to 54. But then for our text, we're actually gonna go back uh, to see how that affects us. And so, Let's just take a look at Matthew 27, 32 to 54. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. 
In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. So when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. And then our text is, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So far the reading in God's infallible and inspired word today. We know that every single word is true because we have an inerrant Bible. Friends in Jesus Christ, this morning we come to look at two men who were very close physically to Jesus. There's Simon of Cyrene, who carried the cross, and the centurion, who pounded the nails into Jesus' hands and feet. And in these two men, we are going to also see something of ourselves. And so when we really think about it, we think of Simon, who is compelled to carry the cross, the centurion who confessed Christ as indeed the Son of God, and us having the conviction that this great biblical account is for us personally in our own lives. And so as we do that, let's begin with Simon. He was forced to carry the cross. And we read about him in Mark 15, 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. So I think we're all familiar with that account of how that went, and the Roman soldier stopped him and likely drew his sword and put it right next to him and said, carry the cross. So he really had no choice. Ray Bolt, you know, had quite a song that he developed about that whole experience. And of course, he wrote about uh, Alexander and Rufus, those two young boys who were instructed to guard the lamb and didn't. And so I'm just going to share with you the words of Ray Boltz's song, Walking on the Road to Jerusalem, the time had come to sacrifice again. My two small sons, they walked beside me on the road. The reason that they come was to watch the lamb. And they said, Daddy, Daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand. 
And so I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said, Dear children, watch the Lamb. There will be so many in Jerusalem today. We must be sure that the Lamb does not run away. And I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said, Dear children, watch the Lamb. When we reached the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers there, no joyful worship songs. And I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men. Then I heard the, cry, the crowd cry out, Let's crucify him! We tried to leave the city, but we could not get away. Forced to play in this drama, a part I did not wish to play. Why upon this day were men condemned to die? Why we were standing here, soon they would pass by. I looked and said, even now they come. The first one cried for mercy, the people gave him none. The second one was violent and he was arrogant and loud. I still hear his angry voice screaming at the crowd. Then someone said, there's Jesus. I scarce believed my eyes. A man so badly beaten, he barely looked alive. Blood poured from his body, from the thorns upon his brow, running down from the cross, falling on the ground. I watched as he struggled. I watched him when he fell. The cross came down upon his back. The crowd began to yell. In that moment, I felt such agony. In that moment, I felt such loss, till a Roman soldier grabbed my arm and screamed, You carry the cross! At first, I tried to resist him, and then his hand reached for his sword. So I knelt and took the cross from the Lord. I put it on my shoulder, and we started down the street. The blood that had been shedding was running down my cheek. They led us to Golgotha. They drove nails deep in his feet and hands. Yet upon the cross I heard him pray, Father, forgive them. Never have I seen such love in any other eyes. Into thy hands I commit my spirit, he prayed. And then he died. I stood for what seemed like years. I'd lost all sense of time until I felt two little hands holding tight to mine. The children stood there weeping. I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us. The lamb ran away. Daddy, Daddy, what have we seen here? There is so much we do not understand. So I took them in my arms and returned and faced the cross. Then I said, Dear children, watch the Lamb. In that dramatic fashion, we know what impact it made in the lives of Alexander and Rufus. In fact, they actually became very strong Christians. What we know from the rest of the Bible is that they went home, shared their experience with the rest of the family. Uh, Simon shared with his wife and sons and daughters. And then we read later how important that family was in the life of the early church. In Romans 16, 13, when Paul is thanking those who have been his helpers, he says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. So obviously, when Simon went home and talked about this experience, his wife decided she was going to really do whatever she could to help the Christian cause. And so Rufus and Alexander became early Christian followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and how much we understand that this is the way in which they were brought to Jesus, they were compelled to do so. If it hadn't been for a Roman soldier, Simon himself says, we tried to go the other way. We tried to escape. I would have missed the opportunity to meet Jesus, except I was compelled to carry the cross. Now you and I are not literally there, but emotionally and spiritually, we feel on this Sunday before the Palm Sunday, exactly how Simon felt. On the one hand, we feel we want to run away. But on the other hand, the Holy Spirit compels us to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to believe in him. Some of us have a Damascus road-like experience where we are growing up without Christ, learning to live for him. And then suddenly we are jarred into reality by an experience in our lives. And Jesus takes a whole new dimension. We are compelled by the Holy Spirit's experiences in our lives to begin to live for him. And so Simon becomes for some of us the compulsory person who brings us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's an example of life changed. So Rufus and Alexander could grow up as Christian boys. And then there's that verse that says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And that's even for those who are compelled by the circumstances to follow Jesus. The second person that we meet on the way is the centurion. And I don't know what you think in your mind of the centurion, but I see him as a hardened Roman person. You know, Pilate, who was condemning people to be crucified, would select someone who was really heartless and ruthless. I kind of picture him as a mean Marine who is able to carry out crucifixion after crucifixion, has no qualms about nailing nails into the hands of feet of those who are crucified. And he's done it so many times, but still he stands with rigid ramrod straight confidence that he's carrying out every command of Pontius Pilate. If you kind of in your mind's eye, think of a dominant soldier, one who has really sacrificed a lot for our country, one who's done extremely daring things, one who's put his life on the line over and over again, you are seeing the Roman centurion. No doubt, the reason the Romans had selected Simon of Cyrene was because he was not a part of Palestine. He would have been dressed differently. He would have been dressed from his culture in Greece, where he came from this rather prominent city of Cyrene. And so it was good for a soldier like the centurion to say, we don't want somebody who might have been calling crucify him, or we don't want somebody who might be sympathetic to Jesus. Here's this man with his two boys and a lamb, and he's dressed like somebody from Greece and Cyrene. He's come a long ways. Let's just compel him to carry the cross. Yes. He was a man with vision, a man with leadership skills, 
a man who had tremendous confidence in himself, and a man who would be far from being emotional because you couldn't crucify person after person on the hill of the skull and not have cut away all your emotions. You simply were going to look straight forward at the life and death issues that are involved in every single soldier. We know the old saying about there's no atheists in the foxholes. And certainly this man was not an atheist, but he certainly was one who was detached from God. His personal relationship with whatever Roman gods or other gods, pagan gods he followed, he certainly was not thinking when he picked up the hammer and nailed the nails into Jesus' hands, nailed the nails into his feet, that three hours later, he would be calling this man the Son of God. And yet, that's exactly what happens. Because whoever wants to save his life, even if he's a centurion, will lose it. But whoever loses his life, even if he was a centurion, will finally call out, surely he was the son of God. None of us have the personality or perhaps the experience of being a soldier, of being a soldier who was called to do a detail that was disgusting and difficult. And yet, we know that this man voluntarily confessed. And we too voluntarily have the privilege of confessing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whether we are compelled, as was Simon of Cyrene, or whether we are simply drawn by the events of our lives to see Jesus on the cross, we must cry out, surely he was the Son of God. And so whether God has given you a Damascus-like experience and changed your life dramatically by some event, or whether you've simply been nurtured in the Christian faith and you voluntarily confess that Jesus is the Son of God, either way, God is looking for you to make a personal decision for Jesus Christ. It's your desire that as a parent, your children would grow up to be like Rufus and Alexander. And it's your conviction deep down inside that you want to follow Jesus every step of the way. That whether Jesus comes to us in the, like Paul on the road to Damascus, or he comes to us by a series of education and Sunday school and school and in our homes, just that general nurture. Either way, we are called out of conviction to confess Christ as our Savior and Lord. Because indeed, as the centurion said, he is the Son of God. Today, we need to remember that if anyone would come after Christ, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me, says Christ, will find it. If there's anything that you and I need to learn from Simon and Centurion, is that their compulsion or their confession must be our conviction that Jesus Christ has come for us 
that we are to live for him, that his death of the cross, his blood that covered Simon of Cyrene now covers me and you so that God does not see us as sinners, but sees us as saved people who will share forever an eternal life in heaven with him. As you look at the cross today, may you see Jesus, who is the Son of God, who died for your sins. And while we're not in the sanctuary to physically see the cross, as you sit at home and listen, in your mind's eye, that cross is standing very boldly there in Grace Church. And you would be there today, and you would be seeing the centurion and Simon and yourself. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today because we know how desperately we need to be covered by the blood. We know that some of Jesus' blood from his brow and the thorns on his head, I covered Simon of Cyrene. And it changed his life and his family life. And Rufus and Alexander, who lost the lamb, they went home to talk about the real lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what an impression it made on their mom and on their sisters and brothers so that it became a strong Christian family. And we thank you, Father in heaven, that entire novels have been written about the centurion, and the man who won the casting of lots and took Jesus' role. We know that those who voluntarily confess Jesus to be the Son of God are actually the very best people we can possibly have in the life of the church. And so for children and for young people who are reaching that age when it's time to confess Christ as Savior and Lord, we pray that they will follow Simon, and the centurion and make their confession out of the conviction that Jesus Christ has died for them and that Jesus Christ is their personal savior and that Jesus Christ died for their friend and for all who believe in him. This is our prayer. We plead with you in the name of Jesus, the crucified one. Amen. At this time in our worship service, uh, we would be singing in times like these. And certainly, this is an unusual time. You're sitting at home listening. I'm sitting in the parsonage speaking to you by computer. And so we know that with a virus that's floating around the nation and around the world, that we are in very different times. And so we just think of that song that says, in times like these, we need a savior. And the savior is our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. That Simon of Cyrene and Rufus and Alexander had as he held his two boys there and they turned and they looked at the cross. And as you hold your family together today, as you worship Wherever you are, may you, like Simon and the centurion, confess that Jesus is Lord. This is our time for taking our offering. And those of you who are thinking about it, realize that while we're not physically meeting in church, the expenses of the church continue. And so if you would like to write a check to the Grace Church, 
or the Corsica CRC, uh, please do so. And you can either mail it to church or you can, if you stop by uh, the Corsica CRC, you can put it in George Feenstra's box. And that way we can continue the ministry of the church even while we're not passing the collection plate. We thank you very much for those of you who, when we were meeting, were putting your offering in the plates that were on the back table so that we didn't have the contact of the plate going back and forth. We appreciate those contributions and we look forward to you continuing your contributions to the life of the church because while the virus goes around, the expenses keep coming along as well. So thank you very much for that. And of course, we would be singing the doxology and praising God. And our closing song would be a song that brings us once again to face Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. At this time, receive God's blessing for your life. The Irish priests always prefaced the blessing of God with these words. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. From Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen. It has been good to share this with you, and please, when you go out, be careful, but at the same time, realize that you may share your faith with the Lord Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, with your friends and neighbors, because we're all in this together. Until we meet again, God's blessings. Thank you.